actually, it'll be easier to just tell you myself what or who solutionaries are. Our team at Graham Media Group came up with solutionaries about a year after the coronavirus pandemic began and months after an intense presidential election and a series of events left our nation divided. So to say this idea came at a difficult time would be a profound understatement. Many of us have dealt with problem after problem, crisis after crisis, and it's no secret that the news cycle can be pretty emotionally draining at times. As journalists, we want to tell stories that matter, even if they are a little difficult to digest. But we don't want you to feel powerless in the face of them, and that's why we're here. Solutionaries is a show that highlights the creative and impactful solutions people are coming up with for the issues you care most about. Problems exist. They always have and they always will, but so do our responses to those problems. Who are the people and groups forging those responses and solutions? And how can we all get involved if we feel so inclined? That's what this show sets out to address. If there's an issue you're passionate about, there's a good chance you're not the only one. So join us on our journey to find the passionate people tackling those problems, the creative thinkers and doers looking to get results, the solutionaries working to make our world a better place. Hey everybody, I'm Lewis Bolden and this is Solutionaries. Today we're gonna have a conversation. In fact, this entire program hinges on a series of conversations. Conversations that include many people with different views, different ideas, and different solutions. These conversations will be at times uncomfortable, but they are entirely necessary. Here's what we're about to dive into. Coming up on this episode of Solutionaries, policing in the 21st century. He was arrested by Daytona Beach Police. And he is the chief of the same department. You cannot teach common sense. Two paths that would not typically cross. They could stop it. But on Solutionaries, they find common ground. I agree with them 150%. And... Everything that goes wrong in society gets shoved down to the cops. The top cop in this police department thinks it's time not only for new strategies. Because the system's broke. And we're the last line of defense. But also a better way of policing. My word is a man. All you, you put that knife down and I'll get you a beer. Plus. This is a great way for us to intervene with these patients sooner than later during their time of crisis. Recognizing mental health problems. This is truly a one of a kind right now in this country. When it's time to stop being a cop and instead recognize a cry for counseling. Because at the end of the day, you're talking about saving people's lives. All that and more coming up. This is Solutionaries. It seems like it's happening every day. George Floyd, Makia Bryant, Dante Wright, Rashard Brooks, Breonna Taylor. These are the names of five people who have been killed by a law enforcement officer in this country. And there are many, many more. In fact, experts estimate more than 1,000 people are shot and killed by police in this country each and every year. Every day, there are encounters between police and civilians that don't end in death, but they can still be traumatic for the person involved, and they can be costly for the agency involved. Our Solutionary's first look focuses on a young man, born and raised in Florida, a musician, who has now filed a lawsuit against the Daytona Beach Police Department. The lawsuit alleges he was wrongfully arrested and that officers used excessive force. Take a look. These are Daytona Beach police officers wrestling 24-year-old Joe Marjorie Wilcox to the floor inside a Daytona Beach pizza shop. One officer sits on his back and handcuffs him, while another places a taser to the back of his head. You can hear Wilcox yelling. You can't arrest me! I thought it was a pistol, and all I knew was there was a weapon to my head, and at any moment, if he felt like it, there goes my life. It was a crowded Saturday night on Daytona Beach in June of 2019. As the bars closed, police started trying to get the crowd to disperse. Wilcox and his friends were among many waiting to get into a pizza shop when Wilcox says Officer Jerome Hassel asked them to leave. So I told the officer, but we're paying customers. You know, it's not like we're just loitering around here. According to the arrest report, Hassel checked with the manager and the manager stated that yes, Wilcox and his friends could stay. As Hassel was about to leave, Wilcox began to use profanity, according to the report. 
The video starts when Officer Hassel approaches Wilcox again, asking what he said. For that? Yes, it's what it. you say? Out of here. You can't arrest me. You can't arrest me. You can't arrest me. Hey. Wilcox was arrested that night for disorderly conduct and resisting arrest. But months later, a judge dismissed both charges, writing, The defendant's words were rude and offensive, but are constitutionally protected free speech. The arrestee had the total power to prevent what occurred. Mike Scudero is the executive director of the Coastal Florida Police Benevolent Association and represented the officers involved in the case. He says the officer arrested Wilcox not because Wilcox cursed at the officer, but because the officer believed Wilcox's language could have incited a riot. He also points out that Daytona Beach PD exonerated the officers. Based on the outcome of the, the internal investigation, he was found to have acted within policy on that. Do you not believe that that is at all excessive? No, I don't think it's excessive at all. Had he just cooperated when he was told to put his hands behind his back, they don't go to the ground. Wilcox says the lawsuit is about justice. I'm ready to see true justice. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm ready to see the justice system not fail. An encounter like the one Wilcox experienced can forever change a person's perception of law enforcement. We originally interviewed him in January of 2021. We checked back in with him a couple of weeks ago and asked how he feels about police after that encounter. We also asked what goes through his mind anytime a person of color is killed by an officer. Anger, pain, um, sadness. Like it could be me. I've always felt like it could be me. You know what I mean? I, even when I was a child, I felt like it could be me. But it does feel like with the police, we haven't gotten anywhere. We're still where we had years ago. We're still getting murdered on the street. Is it possible that some of these interactions, they're not about race, but they're about power? Yes, I don't think a uniform just changes you. I think that whoever you were, you're just that kind of person. That uniform is just extra perks. So when you put that uniform on, you now have like a license to kill. You know what I'm saying? You now have all this kind of stuff that, you know, you probably already thought about doing because it's somewhere in there. That anger, that whole I'm better, it's in there. It's in there. It was in there for a long time. But just having that kind of power just really just opens it up. Like before, it's like a closed gate and you know you can't go through it. But now, since you got a, a uniform, you know, I got the power to do things. I got the power to put people away. I got the power to kill and possibly get away with it. Mostly get, most of the time get away with it. There is no punishment for them. For me, police officers are just a big gang, a gang, a legal one. They're a legal gang, they watch out for each other, and they legally can do things that regular gangs can't do, which is why they get away with a lot of stuff. Like I said, at this point, it's that gang mentality. It's that, you know, watch out for your homie. You know what I'm saying? Don't snitch, cover it up. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, it's more so watching out for your homie. You trust him with your life. And if y'all both power tripping, you're both gonna trust each other to clean up each other's messes. This show is about solutions. Could one of the solutions be other officers saying, it could. That's enough. It could. To uh, one of their own. It really could. They could stop it. They could say, hey man, you go over there, bro, I'm gonna handle this. I'm in a calmer state, I can take this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that could save thousands of lives if they just did something like that. But you won't ever hear that. Wilcox's lawsuit against the Daytona Beach Police Department is still moving forward. A judge denied a request from the defense to dismiss it. Wilcox has very strong feelings. On Solutionaries, we do our best not to operate in a vacuum. We look for input from our community and our audience. We assembled a panel to discuss some of the stories in this show. They had plenty to say and they offered solutions. One of the highlights, the new chief of the Daytona Beach Police Department, he reacted to Wilcox's interview and the two agree on something. 
So I'm just going to introduce our panel. We have Dr. Sydney Crudup, who is a pastor and program assistant with Orange County Public Schools. We have A.V. Tato, who is a local performer and News 6 viewer. And we have Chief Jakari Young, who is the chief of the Daytona Beach Police Department. Chief, what do you think about Joe Marjorick's uh, possible solution to where we are with policing in America? Joe Marjorick said, why don't officers police each other? I agree with that 150% because here's one thing that I've been saying for a long time. You know, whenever you see an incident occur, we focus back on the training and we can train all day long, but there's a couple things. It doesn't matter how much we train. You cannot teach common sense and you cannot teach empathy. You cannot teach common sense and you cannot train someone to have empathy. So I agree with them 150%. When you see someone, uh, an officer getting a little bit aggressive, I expect my officers to step in, grab them by the back of the, the uniform, the gun belt, whatever the case may be, pull them back, pull them back, step in and do your best to de-escalate the situation. So I agree with them 150%. We should see it more. Uh, that's what I expect of my officers. Chief, thank you. A.V., should officers police each other? Yes, I, I definitely agree with that. They don't know them, and they're like, no, I know what I'm doing. But if their peer that has the same training as them, has the same experience as them, that they trust, is telling them, you need to back off, I think it would be a lot more effective. I think it has to also be policing even at the academy level where you have to check who, you know, I know that they have these psychological evaluations, those kinds of things, but I think there needs to be a little bit more policing in that area to see exactly who we're putting in this uniform and who we're putting a gun on. Again, we need to point out that Chief Young was not the chief when Wilcox was arrested, and the officer involved was not allowed to talk because of pending litigation. One Charlie 24 Central. Coming up after the break, the do's and don'ts of interacting with law enforcement. They don't have to tell you that you do not have to consent to a search. When to speak up and when silence can truly be golden. It's best if I just be quiet. And later in the show. I prosecuted the case and got a conviction. Guilty of a crime, but sentenced to no time. Judges are very reluctant to second guess uh, police officers. <laughs> Are there alternatives to the use of deadly force? Look, we can work this out. It's alarming at the number of shootings that are going on around the country. Plus. Why are cops dealing with that? Because the system's broke. Meet the Florida sheriff who is rewriting the book on policing. If I see something good around the country, we're adopting it. And. More cops need to be held accountable. We'll speak with an activist with big ideas to put an end to big problems. This system isn't working. All that and more coming up. I'm Lewis Bolden. This is Solutionaries. So I kind of use a makeshift acronym, which is FADES, Lawyer, Shh. So FADES, am I free to leave? When you've been stopped, if you're walking down the street, an officer might say, hey, how are you? You, of course, can speak back, but if they try to stop you, you can confirm that it is a stop by saying, am I free to leave? Um, the next thing you could do is ask, am I being arrested? If you feel like the stop has gone on for quite a little bit of time and the, the questions are getting more invasive beyond just a general, hi, how you doing? Did you see anybody in this area? Or we're looking for a missing child, something like that, where you can tell it's turning into more of an investigation. You can ask, am I being arrested for what charge? Um, and a lot of the times that's just helpful to know because everything doesn't always look like law and order. The next thing is do not consent to a search. Officers don't have to tell you, unlike Miranda warnings, where they tell you you have a right to remain silent and a right to a lawyer, they don't have to tell you that you do not have to consent to a search. And so it's very important that even if, let's say, an officer does have grounds to search you, um, a lot of the times when you are actually being arrested, they can search with in what's called your lunge distance or your wingspan to confirm that there are no weapons in that area. Um, and again, many times in a traffic stop specifically, that does not include the trunk. So they'll say, can I take a look in your trunk? And you being unaware that they don't have a right to look in your trunk without a warrant might say, no, um, you know, I do not consent to a search. And then if they do it anyway, you've at least said that you didn't consent. The next thing in the FADES acronym is E, express 
express silence. So what that means is, it's a little counterintuitive, you have to assert your right to remain silent. You have to expressly say, I want to remain silent. And after you say that, all questioning should stop. Now, if you reinitiate conversation with the officer by saying, hey, like, actually, I'll tell you what you want to know. Can I get a deal? Then you re waive that right to remain silent. So it's good to expressly say, I want to remain silent. So again, going through the acronym, we got, am I free to leave for F? Am I being arrested for A? I do not consent to a search for D. I express my right to remain silent for E and S, that's fades. Then lawyer, everyone knows this, but you always say, I want a lawyer now, okay? I want a lawyer now. And the reason why is because even if you can't afford a lawyer, one must be provided at you at the time that you are arraigned, right? And so the good thing to know is that once you ask for a lawyer, all questioning must cease. Once you've emphatically stated that, you should remain quiet. So that is why the final thing, if you can't do anything else is shh. And I know that sounds juvenile, but a lot of times when people are nervous around interacting with officers, they don't realize like, I just shouldn't say anything. It's best if I just be quiet. Um, especially if they feel like I've absolutely done nothing wrong. I have nothing to hide. Sure, search everything. <laughs> like, I don't care. I just want to go home, but you never know. So it's always better to just be quiet. <laughs>I'm Lewis Bold and welcome back to Solutionaries. This is a show that doesn't just point out the problems, we also look for solutions. Are there alternatives to officers using deadly force? We have multiple officers weighing in, but first, what happens when citizens and prosecutors feel they've been betrayed by the system that's supposed to be fair to all? Photojournalist Corey Murray and I traveled all over Central Florida for today's cover story. We're approaching the house now, Lewis. That's it right there. This is it. Our first stop, Ocoee, Florida. A quiet neighborhood in a gated community where one night shots were fired at this house. Take a look at what happened. In 2016, when Ocoee police officer Carlos Anglero was sent to the wrong house by dispatch, he ended up shooting several rounds through an innocent family's front door. No one was injured, but Anglero was charged with a second degree felony for firing into an occupied building. Anyone is capable of committing a crime. It doesn't matter who you are. We've, we've seen it throughout our history. Deborah Barra, the former chief assistant state attorney for Orange and Osceola County, Florida, prosecuted the case. Anglero took the stand and the jury ended up finding him guilty as charged. I feel I did the right thing. I prosecuted the case and got a conviction. Barra says she was shocked at what happened next. Now, this all happened at the Orange County, Florida courthouse where we just pulled up. Barra was pushing for the maximum sentence of 15 years. Instead, the judge withheld adjudication. We'll get back to what that means later on. Instead of 15 years or even the minimum of one year, Anglero basically walked out a free man. I respectfully disagree with the outcome in that. Judge Kim Shepard sentenced Anglero to three years of probation and 100 hours of community service, but no jail time. By withholding adjudication, not requiring Anglero to serve time for his conviction, the former police officer is not considered a convicted felon. If the judge had adjudicated him guilty, he would be a convicted felon and would be no longer able to legally carry a firearm. So he absolutely could not be a police officer. Actually, it does not surprise me. Dr. Phil Stinson is a criminologist at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. He tracks officer arrests and prosecutions around the country. We know from my own research that judges are similarly uh, very reluctant to second guess uh, police officers uh, in their official conduct. And those are the cases that actually make it to a courtroom. Stinson started tracking police killings in 2005. From 2005 until 2014, he estimates that about 10,000 Americans were shot and killed by police officers. But during that decade, his research shows that 110 officers were criminally charged. Of those, 42 were convicted, 
50 were not convicted, and 18 of those cases are still pending. It's very difficult for prosecutors to obtain a conviction, even in cases of these shootings where we have strong video evidence. Of the 42 officers that were convicted from 2005 to 2014, five were convicted of murder. 37 others were convicted of lesser charges, everything from manslaughter down to reckless discharge of a firearm for taking a life. Yes, I, I think it shows a bias towards the police, and that is something that's very real, and I think that that prevents justice. Anytime an officer takes a life, it is a tragedy, not only for the victims, friends, and family, but also for the officer. In the case of Officer Carlos Anglero, firing into that house meant he had to stand trial, and he had a controversial sentencing. But don't officers have alternatives to using deadly force? And you know, Lewis, I would think officers with their training they would have a lot of alternatives, especially when they're trying to de-escalate a situation. And that is exactly what brought us here on the campus of Valencia Community College. We go behind the scenes of a law enforcement training looking for answers. Focus on that front sight. All right, squeeze the trigger, squeeze it. It is a 360 degree simulator. Hands out like an airplane. Designed to prepare officers for real life situations. And of the 200 plus scenarios it offers, sir, take your hand down, please. 65% are designed to teach officers not to fire their weapons. Look, we can work this out. But, but instead, de-escalate the situation. De-escalation can be communication. It can be listening, uh, employing empathy, creating distance to give yourself more time to make decisions. Captain Todd Gardner is with the Orange County, Florida Sheriff's Office. Is the goal to stop or to lower the number of shootings, is that the ultimate goal? Oh, absolutely. And here's why. In 2015, the Washington Post started tracking fatal law enforcement shootings around the country. From January 1st, 2015 until June 1st of 2020, the Post documented 5,360 Americans were shot and killed by a law enforcement officer. 346 of those shootings happened in Florida. As a 26 year veteran in law enforcement, I can tell you that, that your goal is never to, to end the situation with, with use of force and certainly not with the use of deadly force. And right down the hall from this simulator at Valencia College. That's an emotional way. John Bostain with command presence training is teaching a new course, de-escalation strategies for best possible outcomes. The class is filled with law enforcement officers from across Central Florida. It's alarming at the number of shootings that are going on around the country. Deputy Chief Vince Ogburn is taking the course and will then teach the techniques to officers at the Ocoee Police Department, the same police department that formerly employed Officer Carlos Anglero. We can use this tool to try to get the best possible outcome rather than someone getting hurt whether it's the individual or the officer. In the United States, there are no national standards for law enforcement use of force. And while many departments have de-escalation training, experts say there have been no rigorous studies that prove whether the training works, nor are there any that prove it doesn't work. We drove not far from Valencia College to Winter Park, Florida, to see what others think about de-escalation training. The killings right now, you know, everybody, of course, is, uh, you know, me, I get worried about my son going out every single day. Do you think officers are using these de-escalation techniques? No, not at all, not at all. And um, if they've gone through training, evidently they're not using it. I, you know, we see it all the time on the news. Do you think officers use those alternatives enough? It, again, depends on the situation. If you have a gun pointed at you, who's like, I mean, they have to protect themselves as well. Mm -hmm. But I do believe in de-escalation. Okay. I believe in the heat of the moment. You have cool head, you know, cooler heads prevail. And mm -hmm. I do believe in de-escalation. The de-escalation course featured in this story is going to be taught a number of times across the country throughout this year. Coming up on Solutionaries, a Florida sheriff institutes across-the-board changes, preparing his deputies for a new set of challenges in the community. For now, I'm going to detain you. You're, you're not under arrest. The way we stopped Mr. Griffin is the way we would stop a white guy, a black guy, a Hispanic guy, or a purple guy. And at the end of the day, you're talking about saving people's lives. How a one-of-a-kind partnership between police and a group of volunteers pushes a community to the forefront of effectively dealing with a mental health crisis. This is a great way for us to intervene with these patients sooner than later during their time of crisis. That story and more coming up next on Solutionaries.
Let's be honest, sometimes words are hard. Well, the words themselves can be simple, but the meanings behind them can get pretty complicated. I'm Brianna Voles, and today, let's take some time to define. Moments ago, you may have heard my friend Lewis use the words withheld adjudication and thought, with, huh? Yeah, it's as confusing as it sounds, but that's why we're here. First, let's start by thinking of the word adjudication as conviction. Here in Florida, where I live, you can be guilty of a crime, but not convicted of it if a judge decides to withhold adjudication. Courts in other states offer options along the same lines with some changes in the fine print and just call it something else. For example, in Texas, it's known as deferred adjudication. Basically, what it means, according to the many law sources I used to write this, is that you get some of the consequences for doing something wrong, just not the really bad ones. It's kind of like when you get a speeding ticket and you were obviously speeding, but the judge sends you to driving school instead of handing down a fine and putting points on your license. You follow? Okay, real quick, let's go back to that word conviction. Lawyers tend to push for their clients to have adjudication withheld or deferred because it avoids that key word, conviction. If you're convicted of a felony, you could be stripped of your civil liberties, like voting or carrying a gun. If you're never adjudicated or convicted in a felony case, you avoid becoming a convicted felon, which means you can still mark no on that job application that asks if you've ever been convicted of a felony without being a liar. Just a heads up though, any withheld or deferred adjudication likely still shows up on a background check. So some unsolicited non-legal advice from yours truly, just try to avoid that whole crime thing altogether. Problems will always exist, but this show looks for solutions. I'm Lewis Bolden. Given the many shootings involving law enforcement, there have been calls nationwide to defund the police. But one Central Florida sheriff says that is not the answer to this issue. Instead, he's taking a different approach. Solutionaries correspondent Eric Sandoval takes a closer look at how one agency is doing things differently. <music> This is Volusia County, Florida, home of the Daytona International Speedway, one of the world's most famous beaches, and a local lawman who is not so quietly making some big changes to a not so small sized county. Sheriff Mike Chitwood is the man who's in charge of law enforcement around here. He has a career that has spanned decades. He's an outspoken man, a man who doesn't hold back. And as you're about to see, he's also a man who doesn't mince words. That we're allowing this man, he's not even a man, he's a scumbag. They're scumbags. Who is this guy? For lack of a better term, he's a thieving piece of And it's not just lip service. Chitwood is also a man of action. Get back! Get back! This is Chitwood at the scene of an armed carjacking in 2019. Get a shield! Who's got a shield? Right in the middle of it with his deputies, without a bulletproof vest. Chitwood says he knows people look to him and his office to help solve a lot of their problems. But he says the reality just isn't that simple. Everything that goes wrong in society gets shoved down, shoved down to the cops. We get it. <laughs> with mental health, drugs, homelessness, you think of it. People, why are cops dealing with that? Because the system's broke and we're the last line of defense against something. So are you trying cops. to fix the system? We're trying to turn that system on its head. We wanted to find out not only what Chitwood is doing, but why. Those changes began as soon as Chitwood took the oath of office in 2017. That I'm duly qualified to hold office. To hold office. The first one, implementing new training for his deputies, starting with the basics of how deputies respond to calls. Deputy Ryan, Volusia County Sheriff's Office. Right out of the gate, Chitwood started with de-escalation training. I just woke up like this and then the right. room was like this and I don't remember anything. I got somebody here to help you. 
and they, they want to take you somewhere where we can get you cleaned up. Where deputies learned how to end stressful encounters peacefully. Damn. Shot fired. The training was put to a big test in June. That's when deputies engaged in a standoff with a 12-year-old boy and a 14-year-old girl armed with an AK-47 and a shotgun. You can hear shooting at the children was not what the deputy wanted to do. Don't let me do this. Don't do this. It wasn't until they say the girl came out of the house firing her gun that they were forced to fire back. What's your name, sweetie? Rip it. What's your name? And they immediately jumped in to help her. When we first embarked on this de-escalation training and time, distance, and cover, I got yelled at and screamed at, you're going to get deputies killed, somebody's going to die. What you see is injuries to deputies have dropped by 50%. Injuries to suspects have dropped by 50%. Crime has dropped by double digits. Take a look at the results he says he's had. Use of force incidents within the Volusia County Sheriff's Office dropped from 122 the year he took office to 87 the next year and only 65 incidents in 2019. Will you come out and talk to me? Why not? Deputies got body cameras. Central Repatch Daytona. And they trained in how to deal with people who may be battling mental illness. My word is a man. All you, you put that knife down and I'll get you a beer. And the sheriff tells us he can't wait to start his own police academy this summer. <laughs> is there a playbook that you're playing from or are you just it's taking a, good it, ideas it, as they it, come along? It's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to tell you this. As a, as a Catholic schoolboy, I would probably would be punished for it. I'm not afraid to plagiarize. <laughs> if I see something good around the c country, we're adopting it. If I see a policy or a training issue that somebody is handling or training uh, philosophy, we're going to incorporate that. Why haven't more departments adopted the policies that you've implemented and been successful? With? Uh, fear of change, and we've always done it this way, and this is the way it's going to be. And, and, and that is something I always hated. I hated it when I was a young cop hearing somebody say, well, why are we doing this? It's kind of stupid. And have somebody say, shut up, kid. This is the way we've always done it. We've done it this way for 50 years. Yeah. <laughs>
for like the normal person who goes around every day, the normal cop, who's like, I have no biases, I'm not racist, I'm equal to everyone, it kind of can be an eye-opener to say, hey, maybe you do have some biases. Was it an eye-opener for you? It was, yeah, because yeah. you don't, you grow up thinking little beat-down Honda is a, either an addict or a drug dealer or something like that, and more often times than not, it's a college kid that mm -hmm. couldn't afford a nicer car, but it's like those little little things that are in the back of your head that you grew up seeing on either TV and in, in the media on Facebook, mm -hmm. like this kind of car equals drug dealer. This kind of car equals this, 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 and it makes you think like, no, <laughs> that's not how it is. So do you find yourself checking yourself as you approach a scene? Yeah, I do. Cause you'll walk up to a house that could be in a rundown neighborhood and you'll think, Again, maybe it's the drug area, and you walk up, and it's this little grandma who has just lived there for 50 years, and the bad neighborhood grew around her. Chitwood says all of this training is just the beginning. Are we perfect? Hell no. But we, I think we we're all striving for perfection, not mediocrity. Sheriff Chitwood's push for better, more specific training has even caught the eye of the Florida legislature. During this year's legislative session, lawmakers approved a bill that outlines new training for law enforcement officers across the state. That training includes de-escalation training. House Bill 7051 received broad bipartisan support in both houses. It is now currently on the governor's desk. We'll let you know if he signs it into law. And let's check in with our Zoom panel to get their thoughts on the piece we just saw. Dr. Crudup, we heard that word empathy yes. in, in that piece. Are, are law enforcement officers empathetic enough? Me working with um, a couple of law enforcement agencies locally, I got to know quite a few of the officers who were very empathetic. And I think sometimes the stories that are out there about police officers who are not empathetic uh, has a tendency to have people paint the entire community with a broad brush. We know they're good officers. Um, we know they're bad officers. And I think the problem, going back to one of the earlier pieces we were talking about, is if there's no consequences for the ones who don't show empathy, then we're going to automatically think that none of them have any empathy. And that's not necessarily the case. What did you think about the, uh, the person being detained in that piece? and how that all played out. I thought it was handled well, um, considering on, on both ends. And I think the, um, the man who was detained was uh, made a good point when he was talking later. He's like, you also have to put yourself in the, the shoes of the police officer and say, listen, like I was given this as a description, you fit it. They were both respectful, they were honest, um, and they had their cameras on so you could see everything that went down. And I think the cameras help a lot because they, they hold you accountable. But I also wanted to chime in. All right, Chief, please tell us your thoughts on that. When I look at that piece, it's frustrating for me. I'm going to tell you why it's frustrating for me. It's frustrating because underneath my uniform right now, I have on a white T-shirt. Underneath my uniform pants, I have on black shorts. Mm -hmm. And newsflash, if you haven't noticed, I'm a black male, right? So when I take my uniform off, if I decide to go for a job and, and, and I fit the description, guess what? I fit the description. Sometimes it's frustrating to fit the description. Right. That's why the way those deputies treated him, it was so important because even though he, he was completely cooperative, he was completely cooperative because it was it was the empathy that they showed him. And even when he went in the train, he said it. He said, empathy, empathy, empathy. Empathy and communication can completely change the dynamics of, of the contact. May 25th, 2021 marked one year since the death of George Floyd at the hands of Derek Chauvin. In the beginning of the pandemic, many Americans protested in the streets to push the Black Lives Matter movement into the spotlight. I'm excited for you to meet our next solutionary. 
Megan Thomas is 26 years old, but wise beyond her years. She is the founder of the Tampa Bay Activist Network and co-host of Tampa City Council Watch, which you can find on YouTube. In most shows, an interview like this would be broken down into short sound bites with a running time of about a minute or so, not with solutionaries. Here's today's very powerful interview that we think is worth more than a minute. For the people that are watching right now, what can they do today to start creating the society that you envision? Uh, talk to your neighbors, ask them if they need anything. Because that's where it starts is, is in the community. So I started Tampa Bay Activist Network after George Floyd was murdered um, in June of 2020. And I wanted to make uh, a way for people to get involved with their local government. And so you started T-Band after George, George Floyd and seeing um, that other people were outraged. How, what was your feeling after that happened? Oh my God, I was like, obviously devastated. I'm tired of this happening over and over again. Um, it's really hard to think about. Uh, I. It's very traumatizing. So even talk about it, I'm getting like choked up. And um, it, it just, it's, it's hurt, it, it's hurtful. It's hurtful to see that happen and I just, I'm hurt for the families that have to go through that and see it over and over again on national television. And, but you know, we're doing what we can. It's just seeing something happen that doesn't have to happen uh, at the hands of the state. You know, seeing the the power trips of police officers. The fact that there's nothing that we can do about it, and in their mind, they're just like comply now and complain later. It's like people are still complying, but they're dying. You know, so you feel powerless and being in a state of powerless can be very traumatic. Like you, there's nothing you can do. It, it, it almost feels like there's nothing you can do to, to fix the situation. So that's kind of what makes it traumatic for me. You mentioned um, officers being on a power trip. Do you think that's, that's what happens in most of these cases? Um, yeah, a combination of of the fear that comes from racial profiling when you you know have this image in your head of you know how black men are, you know the 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 racist stereotypes. I'm a specimen right here, buddy. Can cause fear in these police officers on top of the fact that they are in a position of power where they can get away with. Almost. They can literally get away with murder. I've been threatened. Watch the show. My life is in danger. My life is in danger. So, and they feel like they have to, you know, always control the situation. And if they feel like they're out of control, then they will do some stupid things to get to get back in control. So, yeah, I think it's definitely a mix of power trip and the racial profiling. Do you believe in defunding the police? I believe in defunding the police as a avenue to slowly phase the police system out. That would be your ideal vision to eventually. Absolutely. Um, when something's not working over and over again for decades and decades, you know, you got to change it. And this system isn't working. People are dying. Why would you, why would we continue with a, why would we continue with a system that's literally murdering people on the streets? 
So we have to figure out a different way to go about, you know, crime, uh, fixing crime, because police doesn't, don't even fix crime. So there's obviously better solutions out there that we need to start exploring. Do you have an ideal vision in your mind? What would the world look like without police departments? Before we even get to that point, we have to provide people with the necessary resources to live. You know, um, all this crime is happening because people don't have the resources that they need in order to live a, a flourishing life. And so once we get that down packed and um, we start building community and mutual aid networks and we're there for each other and we provide what the other lacks, I think that's that's what an ideal world would be. We don't we won't need the police at, at a certain point but we have to start going down that avenue and phasing it out. For the people that are watching right now, what can they do today to start creating the society that you envision? Uh, talk to your neighbors, ask them if they need anything. Because that's where it starts is, is in the community. And also not only talk to your neighbors, talk to the people that represent you in your local government. Um, a combination of both of those things is very powerful. Um, because if they, if your local leaders know that you're watching them, they're more likely to represent you. If you tell them what you need, um, they'll, they'll have that in their mind and hopefully make the right choice that reflects what you and your community needs. Coming up next, a police officer looks at his city's growing mental health crisis and reaches out to ordinary citizens. It's the first time that this type of a system is being put in place that is truly a, a public-private cooperative, if you will. Coming up, the unique community solution tackling the mental health crisis. Solutionaries will be right back. here again back to help you tackle another set of words by taking some time to define. Implicit bias. It's something you've probably heard a lot about recently, but you might not really know what it means. So to define it, let's start by breaking it down. First, what's the meaning of the word implicit? By definition, and shout out to Merriam-Webster for this one, something that is implicit is present but not consciously held or recognized. Basically, it's something that's there, we just may not realize it's there. That's implicit. Now on to bias, which is an inclination of temperament or outlook, especially a personal unreasoned judgment. Others might refer to this as prejudice, which Merriam-Webster defines as a preconceived judgment or opinion. Now, if you marry those two definitions, an implicit bias is an attitude, feeling, or even stereotype we assign to certain people or things without knowing the whole story. And since we don't realize we have them, we're probably not going to realize when they're affecting our decision making, which experts say makes them really hard to get rid of. Somewhere you might spot an implicit bias now that you know what to look for. Well, let's say you're sitting in traffic and you see someone approaching your car. Something inside you tells you to lock your car. What was that something? Did you consider that person a threat because they look a certain way? Because of their sex, maybe their race? When you automatically assume something about someone else after taking just one look at them, you might have an implicit bias. Ask any person of color and they can remember at least one time they got an extra look by security in a department store. They had someone lock a car door as they walked by, or they were stopped by police because somehow they looked suspicious. 
It happens to every person of color, even a police chief. During our conversation with our panelists, Chief Jakari Young weighed in with some personal experiences. What is it like to walk through the world being a police chief and a black man? It's very interesting, interesting because I can literally tell you I've been in stores in plain clothes and you can see body language. You can see a level of discomfort um, to where if I'm in uniform, that same person that appears to be uncomfortable by my presence, they won't stop talking to me because I'm in uniform and they love the police. So they'll come up to me and they want to talk to me and tell me stories about, you know, other family members that they know in law enforcement. And they'll stand there and they'll talk to you for 15, 20 minutes. But if I'm in plain clothes, I've literally seen a, perch, a, a purse, purse clutch underneath my arm. They have no idea. I'm the police chief and I would be the first one to help you if someone actually came and tried to, to rob you or, or assault you in any way, shape, form, or fashion. So it's very interesting being both. I could probably, that could be its own segment, just talking about that. And, and how do we, uh, obviously that's a problem that's much bigger than you and the Daytona Beach Police Department, but how do we as a country begin to correct that? You know what? I don't know. I don't have that answer. I think, you know, it's all in how we're raised and where we're raised. You know, we've already talked about implicit bias. Implicit bias is real. And I honestly don't have that answer. I think we have to continue to have these dialogues and discussions, and we need to just be able to see people for who they are. But I don't know if there's a way to just completely overcome it, at least in my lifetime. I honestly don't know. But I agree with you, Chief. Keep having the conversations. I agree 100%. Over the last year, the mental health crisis in the U.S. has gotten worse. Some say it's due to a shift in resources due to the pandemic. This is a show about solutions. So we are highlighting a city in Central Florida that has created a first of its kind public-private partnership addressing mental health. It is reimagining the role of the community and law enforcement. Solutionaries Eric Von Anken has the story in today's Reporter's Notebook. How are police departments evolving? How are they adapting? What are they doing to show that they are hearing the messages loud and clear coming from the communities they serve? Hey, I'm Eric Von Anken, an anchor reporter here at WKMG in Orlando, Florida. Dude, dude, put, put, put down the gun. Put down. Uh, we've seen encounters with law enforcement um, where the person uh, who needs help doesn't get the help. Uh, instead, they end up injured by law enforcement. Sometimes they end up dead. They often hurt themselves or kill themselves or even or even hurt or kill others. We want to be able to prevent that. And, and we know that police officers are not mental health counselors. But what police have realized is, is that's not the most effective way. Essentially, you're just moving a person from one place to another and, and the problem continues. So the Lake Mary Police Department started what they call the Mental Health Intervention Group. And 
as far as they know, and as far as we can tell, this is the first time that any police department has started uh, a nonprofit, really, involving so many partners all around the community. We've got to get you guys involved. Yeah. So, yeah. political personas. We're talking pharmacies, we're talking hospitals, uh, pastors, uh, rabbis. Provide food. Food pantries, bringing them all together, all on the same team, to give the mentally ill in their community exactly what they need. In some cases, delivering all the resources to these people directly. We do have a transport lady that will assist in getting them their food. Social workers, 31 social workers. So the way this works is the police and the hospitals identify the people who are suffering from a mental illness or in, in just in crisis, direct the social workers to those people's homes they reach out to them, social workers reach out to them. They discover what do those folks need. When you have people that are suffering from mental illness and those individuals do not have access to food, a lot of times they don't take their medication. We wanted to be a part of this initiative. Um, over the last couple months, we've had an increase in our behavioral health population. And this is a great way for us to intervene with these patients sooner than later during their time of crisis. And then the idea is these people um, get better or get as healthy as they possibly could and they stop involving police so the encounters with police um, one either go better or two just stop happening altogether or at least lessen a whole lot because the people are getting the help all along instead of letting it build up to a point where police have to show up and these people are making threats to harm themselves or somebody else. Officer Hudson says the volunteer members of the Mental Health Intervention Group will share in taking care of those in crisis while reducing the load on police and the potential for tragedy. Hudson hopes other communities will follow Lake Mary's lead. Coming up after the final break, our Solutionaries panel offer their observations on policing in America. If you expect me to check my son or to check my nephew or my niece and to have them to respect law enforcement, then we want law enforcement to do that with their officers. Solutionaries will be right back. I'm Lewis Bold and welcome back to Solutionaries. Let's get some final thoughts from our panelists. We wanna see, you know, checks and balances. You know, if you expect me to check my son or to check my nephew or my niece and to have them to respect law enforcement, then we want law enforcement to do that with their officers. There should be a consequence because without consequences, you end up with consequences. When there is no consequence, it shows you that, hey, I did it, I got away with it, and I could possibly get away with it again. I think the statistics obviously stand for themselves that, that people are being killed and they're not, the very, very few officers are actually getting the punishment, I guess, for murder like a normal civilian would. There's a program that I started back in January and it's a very simple concept and it's called Park, Walk and Talk. And it's basically, I'm, I'm mandating my officers, we work 12 hour shifts, to at least spend 30 minutes a shift walking a beat in your community and getting to know those that we serve in our community because I think that is truly the key to bridging the gap. You have to know and understand the community that you serve. And then when we do that and we're consistent in our efforts, then you'll see a lot of things de-escalate on their own. I just want to say thank you to our panelists for taking the time to be with us and being so open and honest about their experiences. In this episode, we highlighted the solutionaries who are passionate about fighting for a more equitable future. A future where men and women aren't afraid of being killed during traffic stops. So let's recap some of our solutions. Officers should police each other. There should be more de-escalation training. Citizens and officers have to be more empathetic towards each other during interactions. Citizens must follow lawful commands. Officers must be held accountable when using excessive force. There should be specialized units to handle calls dealing with someone with a mental illness. Officers should get to know the communities they serve. And one of the most important, 
we have to all continue having the conversations. We want you to know the power to be a solutionary and enact change is in your hands. You can get involved in the movement and help ensure that the problems we're encountering now don't persist for generations down the line. We also want to know about other solutionaries you'd like us to highlight in upcoming episodes. Maybe you've noticed an issue that desperately needs addressing. We value your feedback. We have a forum set up at solutionariesnetwork.com where you can vote on ideas for upcoming episodes. And if you want to get in contact with us, send an email to solutionaries at grammedia.com. Until next time, I'm Lewis Bolden. Thanks for watching.